Over the past few weeks, we've talked about some of the key pattern drivers that we expect to impact the 2024-2025 winter season. This includes La Nina and our oceanic temperatures across the globe. If you didn't check out those videos, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and see what they could indicate for this upcoming winter. But there's one key driver that we haven't talked about yet, and that's the polar vortex. The polar vortex is something that can always have a big influence on the pattern, not only across the U.S., but across the globe. And in today's video, we're going to talk about what it could mean for the upcoming winter, what it actually is, and then some of our top signals for what it could do for 2024, 2025. Before we get into that, guys, be sure to scan the QR code in the top right to get our Clarity Weather platform. It's our Clarity Weather app. You can get all of our long range forecasts, including our winter outlook on Clarity Weather for as little as $8 a month. Plus, of course, any forecast for your specific location that you need and custom forecasts from our meteorologists, including videos, and impending weather alerts. In terms of the polar vortex, guys, for today's update, I think it's important that we understand the polar vortex in winter is always something that is there. The stratospheric polar vortex is something that is always over the Arctic Ocean, and it always will have some kind of an influence on the pattern, whether it's strong, whether it's weak, it's always there. It's not something that just magically appears. At times, what can happen is a more stable, strong polar vortex can begin to warm or weaken, which can allow for lobes of the vortex to shoot southward into the mid-latitudes. This is when you get those very, very notable Arctic outbreaks like Texas saw a couple of years ago, or like much of the U.S. saw back in January of 2014. The key to getting these is the polar vortex actually has to weaken. Sounds kind of strange because you would think when it gets so cold, the polar vortex would have to be strong, but to get the cold air to come further south, the vortex has to weaken and it has to allow the jet stream to get wavier. If we take a look at what a stronger polar vortex would look like, you typically get a, a very compact, confined area of very cold air way up in the stratosphere or even in the atmosphere, in the middle part of the atmosphere, in the troposphere. This is an example of what it looked like in November of 2013 before the polar vortex outbreak of 2014 happened. You had a cold, strong, compact polar vortex right over the Arctic. It prevented cold air from coming south into the mid-latitudes. However, by early January of 2014, we saw a much weaker polar vortex. There was a warming that occurred, and it allowed for lobes of colder air to seep southward into the mid-latitudes, into Asia, and into the United States. The polar vortex doesn't always behave in just one way or the other. It's not as simple as one year it's weak and one year it's strong. You can get variations throughout an entire season, and sometimes you can get a complete breakdown of the polar vortex. When that happens, you can even get a displacement where the lobe of the vortex moves away from the Arctic Circle to another side of the planet. The example here on the left would indicate a notable Arctic outbreak across parts of Europe, or you can get a split event where you get two lobes of the vortex to split apart and work towards different sides of the planet. These situations can bring some of the coldest air in winter, and it can also bring cold air to two different parts of the planet. While a displacement event may send cold air to one side of the planet and not the other. For example, you can get displacement events that send cold air over to Asia, but keep the U.S. warm, even though it's technically a weaker than normal polar vortex. So what about 2024? Well, similar to a lot of other things that we've already talked about, La Nina will have an influence. But there's also another pattern driver that not a lot of people talk about in the stratosphere, and it's called the quasi-biennial oscillation, or the QBO. Sounds like a crazy fancy term, but in reality, it's just measuring whether winds in the stratosphere tend to move, move more easterly or more westerly. If we take a look at similar years to what we expect for this upcoming winter, positive QBO and some kind of a cool neutral or weak La Nina, in December tends to favor a displacement of the polar vortex and a weaker polar vortex into the United States. This would amplify the potential for notable cold air shots 
early this winter. However, these years into January and February, while it continues to weaken the polar vortex, it tends to send the coldest air on the planet over into Asia. In fact, if we take a look at the difference in these analogs from December to January and February, December tends to be cold, especially across the northern tier of the U.S., but still a little bit warmer east, while January and February tend to be very warm overall. Based off these initial indications, it would be in line with what our previous research indicated that early winter will probably be the best time frame for cold, snow, and Arctic outbreaks. January and February... Aside from the winter of 2013-14, which was one of the colder winters in recent memory, these years are pretty warm. Overall, that would indicate that early winter is probably a little bit colder, late winter a little bit warmer, but we do still have a couple of months to go to fine-tune this and look into additional details. Again, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more updates on the coming winter. It's BAMWX.com, meteorologist Brett Waltz here. Thank you for watching.